Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to our midday service. We're happy to see you all. It's been a, um, a very trying week for some of us, but thank the Lord that our that we're able to meet together in this fashion. Psalms 105 for us all. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his goodness. Let the whole world know that he is, has done great things. Sing to him, yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Exalt his holy name. Rejoice ye who worship the Lord. Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. Remember the wonders that he has performed. We thank you for coming together to um, this service worship. And can we continue our worship with hymn number 532? Sister Dorothy, um, sorry, before the song is played, um, it's an appropriate point at which to um, just make an announcement to those who are joining us um, on live stream. Um, we apologize if when you're listening via live stream, there is interruption in the service. For example, when songs uh, are played, you might experience a gap. That's because of copyright concerns and we have no choice in it. Um, other alternatives are, um, an, an alternative song may be made, but that's to facilitate for the break. But it's something that we can't avoid, I'm afraid but it's probably best for you to be warned than um, to experience it. It's not that there's a stop in service, it's just an interruption that is necessary. But um, where possible, we try to interject by providing an alternative um, song. So please bear that in mind. Um, we'll have to make this announcement for others who join us from week to week, just to remind them that that's the way it goes on the live stream without, copyright um, licenses, that's how we have to do it for now. Thank you. now have our scripture reading. Good morning everyone. Good morning. 
Good happy Sabbath. Mm -hmm. um, the scripture reading for today, there's two scriptures that we're reading. One's taken from Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. So if you turn there with me, so we're reading Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Paul wrote, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And then when we go to Romans chapter 6, and we have verse um, 5 and 6, and Paul wrote, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So therein, that's the scripture reading for today, and God bless you all. Amen. Amen. At this time, we will go into our intercessory prayer. So if we could take a position of reverence and prayerfulness. And as I speak, you can pray also within your own homes as too. Let us bow our heads. Lord in heaven, we give you thanks that you've allowed us to come once more to fellowship one with another and to use this platform. We thank you, Lord, that you've provided us with these means that despite the times that we live in, we can still come and give thanks and give praises unto your name. Lord, we know that through this time, there are many people who are being almost forgotten and because of not being able to be out and about and live their lives as they once did. We bring them before you at this time that we know you will not forget them and that you'll help us and bring these ones to our minds. Lord, we think of those at this time we know who are struggling, whether physically, emotionally, and mentally. We know that it has been very difficult for many people, Lord. And we know there are those who've lost loved ones and we bring them before you also. We, we come nearer to home, Lord, and we know that we have within the church family, we have many of our members that are not in the best of health, who are vulnerable at this time. We bring them before you and you know each one, you know their circumstances. And we'd ask that you'll place your hands upon them and anoint them as you see fit. Father in heaven, we would not forget our young people too, Lord. This has been a very strange time for them, both in terms of the challenges around education and work and in employment. But Lord, we ask that they may not lose heart, but that they will also come to you and rely upon you to see them through these times. Lord, we know that there are those, the leaders, both within the church and within the secular world that are trying to help to see how best we live our lives during this time. And we pray that you'll give them the wisdom, you'll give them the knowledge necessary so that they may govern aright and help our lives to be lived in such a way that we can experience still the joys that comes from living. Lord in heaven, we bring before you our speaker of the hour. Lord, you know and see everything about him. We trust that you will use him to bring words of comfort, words of encouragement, and words of challenge as we live during this time. So Lord, be with us throughout this your Sabbath and the days that and weeks that lie ahead. Continue to watch over each individual family that is represented here this time. 
and the communities that we are a part of. All these things I ask in your most holy and mighty name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> At this time, we will now have our children's story. Okay, good morning, children. Those of you that are watching, uh, my children's story today is talking about, it's an animation, it's a little animation for you all, talking about Daniel in the lion's den. Now, Daniel ended up in the lion's den because of the life that he chose to live, because of his faithfulness to God. In the midst of a, uh, a situation where he was captive in Babylon, and he was promoted to a high level where he was leading the nation. But some people were jealous because he was leading, so they created laws that caused Daniel to be thrown in the lion's den. I want you to watch this animation and just be encouraged that as you do watch, that even when we have to make decisions in hard situations, if you just trust God, you'll be fine. Um, I know uh, many of the children, you haven't possibly been able to go back to school properly or you've started and then you've had to stop. But no matter what you're going through, I just want you to be encouraged to know that God is in control. And um, you can, if you stand for him, nobody can stand against you. So I hope you be encouraged as you watch this animation that I, I selected for you this week. Amen. Stories of the Bible. Daniel in the Lion's Den. This is Daniel. Oh, hey! Who was a Jewish man who was taken to Babylon when he was very young. Mm -hmm. Daniel loved God and followed God's rules. He talked to God three times a day and asked God for help often. Daniel served in the Babylonian king's court for many years. Yeah, I know him. And under many kings. Hey, Daniel! Daniel always proved himself to be more capable than all the other court officials. I hear a lot of things. Well, every time. Daniel was serving under King Darius, and because of his great abilities, the king made plans to place him in charge of the entire empire. Wow, okay. The other court officials searched for some fault in Daniel, but they couldn't find anything wrong with him. He was faithful, responsible, and completely trustworthy. Wait. The court officials realized the only way to get at Daniel would be to challenge his faith. Come on! So they went to King Darius. <laughs> Excuse me, Your Majesty. And advised him to make a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone except King Darius will be thrown into the lion's den. I like it. King Darius signed this law, and once a Babylonian king signed a law, it could not be overruled. When Daniel learned of this law, he went home and knelt down, as he always did, to pray in his room with the windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he always had done, giving thanks to God and asking for his help. The officials went to Daniel's house and found him praying. Gotcha! They went to the king and reminded him of the law. I remember. Well... Then they said that Daniel had been found praying to God three times a day. What? When the king heard this, he was very upset. Get over here. And he spent the whole day trying to think of a way to save Daniel. Wait, what? By that evening, the court officials came back to the king <coughs> and reminded him that no law signed by the Babylonian king could be overruled. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den. The king said to him, May your God, who you serve faithfully, rescue you. Then the lion's den was sealed shut with Daniel inside. The king spent the night fasting and couldn't sleep. Then very early in the morning, the king hurried to the lion's den. He called out, Hey Daniel! Was your God able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, Long live the king! 
My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be taken out of the lion's den. Then the king ordered the men who had schemed against Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den as punishment. Daniel was safe. There was not a scratch on him, for he trusted in God. Good afternoon once again. It befalls on me this morning to introduce, or this afternoon, should I say, to introduce a speaker for today. Um, for those of us in Bilston and Jane within the Wolverhampton SDA family, he's no stranger. Um, it is Elder Craig Gooden. Um, to give you some background to him, he's, um, he has a number of titles, um, including um, that of the Bible worker for the district, but he's also the coordinator for peace covering um, the Northern Territory or the Northern area of the UK. And for those of you who may not be familiar with this program, it um, stands for the Practical Evangelism Adventist Christian Education. I hope I um, um, got that right, Brother Craig. Um, uh, we know that Brother Craig is very enthusiastic and has a passion for the scriptures and, and also for working with the young people within, both within and without the church. Um, but before we hear his voice, we will have a meditational and then the next voice you will hear will be Elder Craig Gooden.
Good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, grateful, grateful to be here right now. Um, at this moment, um, I'm speaking to yourselves here at Bilston. I wanna say thank you to uh, Brother Donald for the introduction. And yes, you did get the acronym right for peace. Um, practical evangelism, Adventist Christian education. That's what we're about. We're going online this year. So do keep an eye out for what we'll be doing. There'll be some promotion. And in the month of April, actually, if you want to take a note of the dates, the 12th, the 13th, and the 26th, and the 27th, we'll be running some um, training on Zoom on how to do Bible studies online, um, because there'll be, uh, I think it will be helpful for the church members to know how to do it, uh, but also for those that are not doing it already. But also just for the for the wider work and some some opportunities that I think will be appearing very soon. So I want to say good afternoon to you all again. The title of the message today is the life that I now live, um, and the focus the focus of the scriptures. We're mainly going to focus on what Paul wrote in Galatians two verse twenty. Well, the idea of what he mentioned in Galatians two twenty, but also Romans six verse five to six. Um, and I'll probably just talk about those two before I get into the meat of the message. Um, I want to say I'm grateful that my wife's with us right now as well, um, and our son, Israel. Grateful to be here. But as you know, while Zoom is on, um, ministry is all over the place. We're, we're, you're getting brought into one location on Zoom, then another location and another one. But it's still good to be involved in ministry for God at this moment right now. And there's a lot taking place, and it's just a blessing to be involved. Um, so, yeah, let's just say a word of prayer. Then I'm going to read those scriptures, say a few words about them, and then I'm going to get into the message. Also, for those of you that might be watching right now, and you've got some friends that are on Clubhouse, I'm also um, streaming this sermon to Clubhouse right now as well. Um, for those of you that may have some friends or whoever that you think could benefit from this, by all means, um, just let them know to follow me on Clubhouse, Craig Gooden, and um, you can take it from there. I know some people are logged on right now listening. So I'm on Zoom, I'm on YouTube Live, and I'm on Clubhouse. God bless you all. But let's pray. Dear Lord, I'm grateful for this opportunity to be speaking for you. Father, right now, as I'm talking about the topic, the life that I now live, I pray will serve to just encourage anybody who's listening, anybody who's watching, to just make the decision to follow you with their whole heart. This is my prayer. May you, Jesus, be lifted up, and may you draw all men unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I say, amen. Amen. All right, so, uh, you know, as we look at Romans 6, I want you to, to, to understand, Paul wasn't sat at a desk or a nice table with, you know, a, a feathered, uh, a piece of feather dipped in ink writing the letter of Romans. Paul was in prison, desiring to make his way to Spain. He wasn't able to get there. And he's in prison and he's writing a letter, um, he's writing messages that, that are going to make a huge impact. Probably he didn't realize, but a huge impact for the whole of um, the history of the church since that time. And even as we're still living, people are still delving into the book of Romans and Galatians and trying to understand what was he actually trying to say? What was the whole point of the message? In Galatians chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, Paul says, look, for if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, um, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. In Galatians 6, uh, just the, those verses, the verses before that, Paul is actually speaking about baptism. Baptism is this thing that, you know, a ceremony, uh, something that we do when we're out, where we're fulfilling the decision that we've made with Christ. Much like people, when they make the decision to get married and there's the engagement, then there's the marriage ceremony. Once I make my decision to follow Christ and I've said I'm with him, that's like the engagement ceremony. But then the baptism is like that big wedding ceremony. 
it's it's public, it's for people to see, and it's a public declaration for a decision I already made in my life, a decision where I'm I'm saying to the world, I already decided not to follow the ways of the world anymore. I'm choosing to follow the ways of Christ. And Paul says that in this, it's like being planted in his death, like I've been buried into this baptism, like in the likeness of his death, but it's in, been raised up from that. I'm also in the likeness of his resurrection, living a new life. But whilst we're stuck in the same type of world that we're living in, you know, we go down in the pool and we come back and we feel different, but the surroundings are the same. Paul says that in the midst of those surroundings, you can continue living that life, that life of being victorious, of trusting God to help you day by day. But then we also read, Paul makes mention of the word crucifixion in verse 6 of Romans 6. In Galatians 2 verse 20, I just love this verse because of what it says. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So he's saying in the midst of this death, this, this being dead to sin, there's also an opportunity for life. He says, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul's tying this element of living by faith into him trusting what God's word is saying. And he essentially he says, it's not me living anymore because my old life, it's done away with my new life, is a life that's being led by new principles, new morals, um, a new example that I'm following. And that example was, was lived out by Christ. You see, the definition of life has long been a challenge for scientists and philosophers with many varied definitions that have been put forward. And it's partially because life is a process. It's not a substance. It's not something that you can just pick up and say, these are the ingredients. Life is a process. Every single one of us goes through it. We're, we're all here, which proves we've been born. Um, but unfortunately, we don't look forward to that moment where we may die if we don't live to see Jesus return. But death is a whole other thing for us because we're Christians, because we believe what the Bible says about death. And what the Bible says about death is it's a sleep. We're going to wake up. Now, I don't know how many of you enjoyed being woke up this morning. Some of you probably didn't need to wake up. Some of you probably pressed the snooze button. But that moment of being resurrected from Christ, we're all going to be look, looking forward to. And I'm sure none of us would want to press the snooze button on that. But you see here, Paul doesn't try to describe life, but he does say how he lives his life now. And he says the way that he's living his life now is simply by faith. As he says in Galatians 2 verse 20, he said, the life which I now live in the flesh, in this battleground that we're all in, Paul says, I live that life by faith in the Son of God. And he says he, he trusts him because Jesus loved him and gave himself for him. And we know that he not only did it for Paul, he did it for all of you, and he did it for me too. It's a strange concept, but it can be spiritually understood. You see, life describes the period between life and between birth and death, of, as I've explained. And while Paul is saying that he's alive while being put to death, it can be quite strange to understand. But imagine a, a caterpillar, you know, a caterpillar, it's slow, it's moving along, it eats those, the leaves that it walks on. And, but then before it changes into a butterfly, it goes through this metamorphosis, this change, this they, they say as it builds its cocoon and it goes in there, it, it literally just turns to mush. But life is still in there. Life is in this cocoon. And then what happens is this, this, this caterpillar begins to change into a beautiful butterfly. I remember when we visited the zoo, um, my, me and myself and the family, and as we went there, there was a, a whole room where you could just walk in and these huge butterflies were just flying around and people were just amazed by the beautiful colors of them. 
Some were different hues that range from black to pink to yellow. To if they were just beautiful, and watching them graciously just fly and hover around the room was amazing. But I'm sure nobody would have been, uh, nobody would have wanted to so much have picked up when it was a caterpillar, when it was that that thing that moves around and looks like a worm with many legs, and it's got even though some of them do look very beautiful. But God in his power took us when we were just like the caterpillar and he says, I'll help you change. I'll help you in this process to die to the old life and live to a new one. And then he expressly says that it's not you who will be living, but it will be my life in you while you remain dead to the world. You see, in this change, this is where Christ is introduced and he was introduced to my life. And I have learned to realize that the way that I have been living this current life, this was before baptism, I could say, needs to be done, done away with. However, even after baptism, there's a doing away with the old ways every single day because they just seem to come up. And you don't like it when they do come up. Temptations may come, life experiences or moments may come. And you're just in the midst of this situation, this experience where you've got to say, Lord, help me again and continue to help me. But with this point of life being done away with, the old ways being done away with, a new life is constantly offered, and that life is one which is offered by faith. The process of accepting and going through this experience, Paul describes as crucifixion. Imagine that. This whole process that we've got to experience every day, it's called crucifixion. Now, the crucifixion was a most cruel form of torture that led to death. You were impaled with nails to a, a cross that, like Christ experienced, possibly was violently thrust into its position. It's painful. Crucifixion was the most, at that time when Paul was writing, time of Christ and even years after, crucifixion was most often performed to dissuade its witnesses from perpetrating similar um, Crimes. Victims were sometimes left on display, listen to this, after death as a warning to any other potential criminals. Crucifixion was usually intended to provide a death that was particularly slow and painful. Hence the term excruciating, literally the out of crucifying this this pain, this, this suffering that somebody would grow, go through, it was humiliating, it was gruesome, and also very, very public. Using whatever means were most um, expedient at that time for their goal, crucifixion, they aimed to make sure that nobody else would commit crimes. The term used is to dissuade witnesses from committing similar crimes, left on display as a warning, death, being shown as a particularly slow and painful thing, public in its experience. And Paul says he was crucified with Christ. My question is, this crucifixion with Christ, we are on display, as the Bible says, and the whole world is watching every day, dying to self. This crucifixion daily, which seems to be so slow and sh we struggle with it, but God is the one who's to be in control, but it's happening. And we're on display for the world to see that in the midst of this crucifixion, I can live a new life. Can you imagine that? You know, when we look at sin and we consider what was going on, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 21 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Just, just look at a few things with me here. It says here, For he hath made him, speaking of Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So there's this transferring that's taking place. Jesus is taking our place so we can enter into the, the righteousness that he had. When I've often thought about this, and just follow me as I'm going to say this, Jesus Christ on the cross, could it be that when Jesus was on the cross representing you 
and all of your sins, representing me and all of the mess that I was, and in some cases still am, and still struggling to persevere through, but I trust in these verses and acknowledge that I just have to die to self. Could it be that on the cross, in Jesus on the cross, God saw everything he hated, which is sin, in everything that he loved? Just wondering, could could we even comprehend that? Jesus becomes sin, which God hated. But Jesus is also his son, which is everything that God loved. Obedient, all the way to death. And he became the thing, that the, the embodiment of disobedience to do away with it for us. He committed no crimes. In Jesus on the cross, God saw everything he hated. In everything he loved. And it causes, when I think of those things, it causes me to tremble. Because I'm considering this, Jesus did this for me. He became a public display for me. Humiliated because of me. And some could say, yeah, but it was so long ago. But every day when I think about this, it's nearly as if I'm reliving the experience so that I can say that my, the life that I now live is one of faith. <laughs> Nevertheless, in the midst of living this life of faith, it's a life of crucifixion. Jesus committed no crimes, but I have. Jesus was faithful, but I've been faithless. And he's done all of these things to say, if I can do it, Craig, so can you, but not in your own strength. You can only do it with my strength. So God has provided an example through Jesus. And he says, I've given you the example so you can willfully say you will follow it. However, I have to be the one that lives it through you because you in your own strength just can't do it. So why on earth would I choose to be crucified with Christ to suffer such a painful ongoing experience with him? Well, let's consider what the Bible says. You know, what does it mean to be crucified with Christ? What does this death mean? Galatians 5 verse 24. It says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. So those affections and the lusts, those are the main things that I'm saying. Lord, when I'm giving myself to you, this is what I'm going to be willing to give up. Is that always easy? No, because we've been so connected to it. We've been so connected to it. Like I was sharing earlier in a Sabbath school session that was online, you know, I remember when we visited the Dead Sea um, over there in Israel. Excellent location. It's, it's called the Dead Sea, but the location's beautiful. Like when you go there and you're walking and go, like it can be quite painful as you're making the way through, through the sand because there's all of this, uh, the sea as it's evaporated sections have evaporated it becomes sharp pieces of salt and as you're walking over and then you end up in the water you want to experience this moment of just letting go of everything and floating but you have to go deep in you have to go deep into the world where your feet can't touch the ground anymore and just let go and just 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 rest back just ease back and just float and i remember while I was in the, I won't say in the middle of the Dead Sea, but while I was very far in, oh, the experience was just amazing. And all you could hear, as I just took some moments of silence to just listen, all you could hear was laughter. People amazed that they won't sink. And I remember in the midst of that situation, I could see an elderly woman who was, who wanted to just let go and float, but she couldn't get past the idea of just letting go and not having her feet on the ground and just lying backwards. She couldn't do it. And the person that was there trying to plead with her kept saying, just lie down, just let go, just let your feet, let your feet go off the ground, just fall back. And she couldn't do it because she was so attached. She couldn't get past the experience that she's possibly had year after year after year of standing in the sand, not wanting to sink. She believed she would sink. But what God says in these moments is, if you're willing to let go of those affections and lust, the things that we've always held onto, God says, I will keep you up. I won't let you sink. 
this daily experience is a dying to the world, a death to self that has to take place, but it's not always easy. The affections that we've always held on to, the things that are so dear to us, those darling sins, which I want to hold on to, God says in letting go, it's like crucifixion. It's painful. It's painful. There's another verse later in the book of Galatians that alluded to this. In Galatians 6 verse 14, where Paul says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. So here's the point. I can't do this crucifixion myself. I heard one person once give an analogy of what it would be like. Imagine if you have to crucify yourself. You get the hammer in, you've got the nails, and you eventually get the nail on your hand, and then you have to hammer it in. Well, once the one hand has hammered the one side in, how on earth do you put the other hand in? Because the left hand's hammered in the right. How do you hammer the right hand in if the left hand's already in? You can't, you can't do it in your own strength. And God's saying that this crucifixion is only possible by, by, by trusting in Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I am to the world. So as long as I am in Christ, trusting in him, walking with him, following him, keeping focused on him, as Hebrews says, looking unto him, then I'm crucified to the world. The crucifixion in Christ deals with death to sin. Therefore, we see that the, the text isn't saying, uh, by what the text doesn't say, we see what it does say, if you understand what I mean. If the old man is crucified with him, then that means that a new man can live with him. By being crucified with Christ, it means that the body of sin is destroyed, so I don't serve sin anymore. Then what this means is that if I'm not crucified with Christ, then I will remain a servant to sin. And I'm sure none of us want to remain a servant of sin. However, how many of us struggle in saying, Lord, help me to just give up the things that I'm holding on to. During this time, this issue of a pandemic, it's been extremely interesting. Different people have been coming out online. Different struggles have been coming out online. Arguments have been coming out online. Uh, issues that are just so prevalent. And what we're seeing is that in the midst of these, these arguments, people are wanting to hold on to the things that really are holding them back from Christ. The possibility to no longer serve sin is made available by Jesus doing something, something totally fantastic for all of us. He came as a man and destroyed sin in the same flesh that I have to live in. And I think I have to praise his name for that. Like I said at the beginning, this flesh, this body, it's like a battleground. And God says, I'm going to come in the same field that you have to fight this thing in, and I'm going to win it for you. So Romans 3, Romans 8, sorry, verse 3 to 4 says this. Follow with me if you can. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of this sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So what we see is that, that, that God, Jesus came in the same flesh that I've got to battle through, and he condemned the sin in the flesh. He, 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 he was uh, obedient in the same flesh that I have to live in. That means that if he can do it, if he can show that coming as a man, and being obedient, trusting in the Father's strength. He says, if he can do that, so can you through his power. And then he says in verse 4 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And in order to do that, it requires faith. Faith. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says that Enoch pleased God because he believed that God is and that God is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, you have to believe that God is. Faith is simply the medium by which I take hold of something.
faith is the medium by which truth or even error finds a lodging place in the mind. There are people who put faith in things which are not true. I'm choose, I've chosen to put my faith in his word. I, be, I know that this is true and I've experienced that it's true and I'm seeing that experience daily. Through faith, as I've explained, truth or error finds a lodging place in the mind. But God has also given to each and every one of us enough faith to put all of our trust in him. Romans 12 verse 3 says he's given each of us a measure of faith. So here's the thing. If I just believe with the measure of faith he's given me, that little ounce of faith that he's given me, in one verse, he likens it to a mustard seed. He says, if, no, he says, if you even had the faith of a mustard seed. So imagine my faith is smaller than that. God is saying, if you just have faith, okay? And I put my faith in these words. Praise the Lord. It is enough for him to do everything that he needs to do in me. It's all about walking in his spirit. Trusting in him, giving honor to him. Walking in the spirit means every present moment throughout the day, as I balance between the past, the present, and the future, I'm making my decisions based on a real experimental moment with Christ. And then we go to this place where we're brought to, to an opportunity to live and to live a new life. And that life that I'm now living needs to be a life of faith, where no matter how hard the experience of this crucifixion with Christ is, you and I will be willing to let go of the world and those old ways of living so that we can live the new life. And some will never know the privileges of the new life because they're just so willing to hold on to the old life. you like the lady that's in the pool uh, where the promise is that you'll float and never sink. And you'll never have the experience of never sinking because you're still holding on to the thing that will essentially cause you to sink. God wants you to let go of that and hold on to him so he can uphold you and keep you above water. To be crucified with Christ is definitely the right decision and it's definitely the right description that has to be given. Leaving the old world is painful. The separation is tough. The temptations are definitely constant. But it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. I remember, I feel like I'm saying this like it's so many years ago. It was, it was last year, but it just feels so long ago because of the lockdown. But I remember we were on a plane and, you know, the, the, the lady, the, the people walking up and down the aisles giving out food and desserts. And they had too much ice cream. Now, I love my ice cream. And uh, anyway, there's this, this, this striving. And I'm on the plane and I had one dessert. And then the lady came back to me and she said, we've got more. Do you want some? I said, no, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not having too many. I'm, I'm okay. I've finished. She walked up and then she just ease backwards, I want to imagine, she eased backwards and she looked at me, eyes open wide, and she said, are you sure? And there was this whole point of temptation, and I'm like, just leave me alone. <laughs> like, so I looked at her nice and I said, please, I'm not having it anymore. And I just smiled. But in order to get through that experience, I had to hold on to the goal that I've got at the end, and that is, I'm going to be victorious over this thing of not having too much ice cream. Was there a goal? Yes, I want to be healthier. I want to live a different life. And by seeing the goal of where I want to get to helps me deal with the current present issues I'm going through now. What goals do you want in life? Don't focus on the here and the now. Focus on where you're going to get to. Make small decisions today that will end up in huge victories tomorrow. The British cycling team right now, they're winning medals. But many, many years ago, there were companies in Europe that wouldn't even sell them a bike because they thought that if the British, if they sold one of their bright, one of their name brand bikes to the British cycling team, 
people wouldn't buy bikes because the British cycling team kept losing. But what they did, the British cycling team hired a man who then made 1% changes in everything they were doing. So they changed the way that they would wash their hands. They changed the way that they wore their clothes. They, they changed the interior of the vans that carried the bike so they could see the small specks of dust in places that they wouldn't expect to see. They changed the way um, uh, that, they, that they wore the helmets and everything else. And what this did was over time, it caused them through practice, dedication in making small changes, they started winning the medals. And you can see when you go online, they won the medals, they, they won the races because of small changes. Everybody sees the victory, but no, not many people understood the changes that had to be made. Make the small changes today. You wanna write 1,000, 10,000, uh, 10,000 word essay? Well, start by writing 500 or 200 words today. You want to exercise and become the strongest? Start lifting just a few weights today. You want to be able to cycle far like Michael or Clarence can? Then just, just start cycling around the block. What I'm saying is just by making a small change, it will empower you to make the big changes later on. And in the midst of all of this, we have examples. One thing I've learned as we've been raising our son is there are times when we have to try and explain difficult things to him, difficult things for him to understand, but in a way that he can understand. And I remember a moment where I was sat down with him and I thought, how do I explain what I need to tell him without using my adult language so he can understand me? And you know, the best way to do it is simply to show him. That's how he learns, by showing him. And that's how we learn by being shown. A teacher told me once, he said, a good teacher will tell you what to do. An excellent teacher will show you how to do it. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, we have the powerful story and the truth summed up in Peter's words where he says, Christ has left us an example to follow. It's like tracing paper. You've got the perfect image underneath. You put the tracing paper on top and you start etching out the image. But if we try to etch out the image in our own strength, it won't be perfect. So God says, let me, by your faith, hold your hand and let me draw this picture for you, with you. And that's what Paul's saying essentially. The life I'm living, this drawing that I'm drawing, it's no longer I who's doing it, but Christ who's doing it through me. And I'm doing this by faith. My life of being crucified with Christ is a life that is on show. And to do this requires a willingness and a change of mind so that the life that I'm now living in the flesh, we can live by the faith of the Son of God. In closing, I want to tell you about the mentality that holds many people back. People say it's due to something called elephant thinking. Elephant thinking stems from when a baby elephant is trained for the circus. The baby elephant's leg is chained to a pole in the ground. The baby elephant wants to get away. He pulls and he tugs, but they put a very strong chain on to cause the elephant to learn that they can't. It can't pull away. It can't escape. The chain's too big. The pole is too deep in the ground. So eventually, the elephant just stops trying. As the elephant grows up, he assumes that he simply can't get away. Now imagine, after many years, the elephant becomes a six-ton powerful, powerful elephant. He could squeeze and pull the chain out. He could pull the pole out just by, by pulling, just by sneezing, just by pulling away. He could do that because... He has the power to, but he doesn't realize he has that power because he's always being chained. So he doesn't try. Circus trainers have said that they could put a piece of string around that elephant's leg and he still wouldn't break away. This assumed constraint, the string around the ankle, is a belief that you have based on past experiences. 
embedded in your mind, sometimes at a very early age, depending on our circumstances, your parents, siblings, friends, enemies, the environment that, that you live in, all of these things have shaped you along with the things that you were told you could or you could not do. And these same constraints are still around some of your lives today. And I just want to encourage you to let you know that only through Christ can you truly break free so that you can live a new life in Jesus Christ. If you want that, that, that strength to break free of the things which are holding you back, I'm just going to ask you, could you just raise your hands and I'll just see. Let me see your hands. Thank you. I can see your, I can see your hands. It's possible, but it takes faith. So in closing, I'm going to just pray for you all. Pray that you'll be encouraged as we daily go through these moments. So that when somebody asks you, what are you doing in life? Now you can say, the life that I now live is a life of faith because the Son of God loved me and he died for me. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this moment, for these opportunities to pray, to come before you, to put you first. And I pray, Lord, that with all of the hands that have been raised, that we will have that, that, that those moments to say the life which I now live, by faith I'm living because of the Son of God who died to give himself for me. So I'm thankful, Lord. I'm grateful for what you've done. Help us to not have elephant thinking. Help us to break free from the chains which have held us back. And we can do this because you promised that we can. Help us to be able to trust that you will keep us above water. And we long for the day when we'll see you soon. If we end up in the grave, we're just sleeping. If we're alive to see you change, to, to see you come, we'll be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. In both cases, we will be changed because of the change. We will be physically changed because of the spiritual change that we make today. This is my prayer. And I thank you for what you will do and what you continue to say and do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I have to thank Elder Gooden very much for that message of assurance and hope, one that will help us to understand what it is that Jesus did for each and every one of us. Thank you very much, Elder Gooden. At this time, we'll close our service with the use of hymn 534, Will Your Hunker Hold? 
Amen, everyone. Amen. Amen. Do you have that? Are you going to trust that it's going to be grounded firm and deep? So it will not pull you, not be pulled away. I know some of us have had a hard week. I know that because I've spoken to some of us. Some of us, have, it hasn't been easy. And I'm just encouraging you to hold on. God is the one who will keep us going. He will, he's the one that will, will hold us firm and fast. And I just want us to stay encouraged and trust and know that he's the one who's in control. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness and your mercy. And I pray, please, help us to hold fast to you. To know that you're the one who is in control. That will not let us go as long as we hold on to you and stay focused on you. This is my prayer, Lord, in Jesus' name. Help us to have a blessed Sabbath. It's a beautiful day. And I, I pray that as these moments are here, that we'll just see that in the, the good days and the bad days, you're still looking down on us to encourage and inspire us. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you again, Elder Goodman, for your message to us. It's always a privilege for us to have you in our midst. And we look forward again to hearing you. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.